It should be apparent to you from yesterday evening's reflections how necessary it is for us nowadays to turn our inner eye, EYE, towards spiritual scientific insights, to the spheres of existence, the reality in which the sway of the spirit within human evolution is clearly perceptible to those able to survey these regions of reality. Since the mid-15th century, as I told you, civilized humanity lives in a period when the human soul's former relationship to the superordinate beings of the three next higher hierarchies, the Angeloi, Arch Angeloi, and Archai, will become completely different to what it used to be. Previously, this relationship was one in which the beings of these three hierarchies worked upon humanity's evolution, furthering it out of their own interest and impulses. Now, however, we live in an era when the work of these beings of the higher hierarchies has concluded. These beings have no interest in continuing the work upon humanity's evolution, which they previously accomplished. They will only form a new relationship with humankind in so far as human beings begin to engage with worlds of spirit out of free will, free intention. If in the forthcoming times human beings were not to do this, they would lose their connection with spiritual worlds, since the beings of spiritual realms who belong to us have no intrinsic interest in us any longer. We will only awaken their interest if we concern ourselves with the world of spirit through our own inner impulse, or, in other words, cultivate thoughts, feelings, and impulses of will into which spiritual powers can flow. But now you can ask this question, and should do so, in fact, in relation to yesterday's reflections. By what means, initially, do we concern ourselves with worlds of spirit so that in the future, as we evolve on earth, we can maintain our relationship with these higher hierarchies? Here I need to say things that may seem to have no immediate connection with this question. However, we will see that they create the foundation in the present for renewing and recreating our connections with the world of spirit in future. The first thing we must consider here is the efficacy of the various confessions, various religious outlooks and faiths that exist in civilization. Hitherto these confessions directed human hearts and souls toward the spiritual world in certain inevitable ways. In future, by contrast, they will either have to endeavor to allow something quite new to enter, or otherwise they will increasingly serve to reinforce humankind's separation from the spiritual world. Today religious faiths and confessions are basically founded on and oriented to human egotism, as we can see by reflecting on a key theme and tenet of faith, that of the immortality of the human soul. By the way religious confessions usually handle this question, we can see that they count greatly on egoistic human impulses. Mostly when speaking of the soul's immortality, they are referring, albeit for deeper reasons that we will not discuss today, to the soul's continuing existence after death, the continuation of a life of soul. It is fairly easy to speak to people about this, since it offers wide scope for human egoism. People simply cannot endure the thought, quite irrespective of the truth, of not living on in some way after death. When we speak of life after death, we always, therefore, encounter a degree of acknowledgement and understanding in the human soul. You can be certain that interest in the question of immortality, as this is usually discussed today, is egoistic. 
people do not wish to contemplate the death of the soul. Naturally, any future-oriented world view must speak of the soul's immortality, for, as you all know from anthroposophic spiritual science, this is a truth and reality. But religious faiths and confessions have not begun yet to accept the way in which anthroposophically oriented spiritual science speaks of the continuing existence of the soul after a person has physically died. But something else is also important, that modern human beings hear immortality spoken of in a quite different way from accustomed views. Besides speaking of life after death, when discussing the soul's immortality, we must speak also, and in relation to it, of this life here in the physical world between birth and death, and of the fact that, as you know, this life is a continuation, too, of the existence we led between our last death and the birth that brought us into physical existence again. Humanity will need to learn to see this physical life of ours between birth and death as the continuation of a spiritual existence prior to birth or conception. In every growing child, from day to day, from week to week, and from year to year, we must perceive powers emerging from within that originate in worlds of spirit which pass through birth and work upon the gradual elaboration of the human being from birth onward into a person's later years. In a sense, we will have to decipher the divine within the human being by intervening developmentally in the child's life. Social relations between people will need to integrate something of a religious impulse that permeates all our interpersonal connections. But the most essential thing will be that people become able to gain a feeling apprehension that this physical life of ours is a continuation of a spiritual life before birth, of soul spiritual existence, rather than continually forgetting this. Many other things connect with this such as that we come to see again that our intrinsic human nature rests in the depths of our being and gradually emerges. On a previous occasion, I described to you conditions prevailing in ancient times, earlier periods of evolution, for example, in the second post-Atlantean epoch, as anthroposophy refers to it. I pointed out to you that back then, Human beings remained capable of development into old age in a way that is now available only to a very young person. Early in life we pass through a stage of physical development around the age of seven at second dentition and then a further metamorphosis expressed in physical life at puberty. After this, developments continue but proceed in a less noticeably outward way. It was not so in ancient times. Then whatever soul-spiritual developments a person passed through came to expression at much later ages. Today we are already old at 16 or 18, and one finds to one's alarm that very young people appear old. Here's an example. Some time ago in Stuttgart, the Cultural Committee met to discuss modern educational approaches. All sorts of points of view were aired. Then a young man stood up, well, let's say a young man, but I might also say an elderly youth, who said that he wishes to instruct society in the real ideals underlying education. He first uttered some very formulaic phrases, then read out a program for the place of education in modern society, but he was continually interrupted, so much so that he had to finish his speech and did this with these words, quote, I see that age no longer understands its own youth. Close quote. Then he sat down again. I replied to his comment that I understood people's failure to comprehend what he was saying, but not for the reason he had given. In fact, he was speaking from a far 
too aged perspective, like an old man. He had offered principles that were really abstract in the extreme, an attribute of old age. Usually people nowadays only develop up to a certain age, during which they absorb all sorts of things and are not ashamed of changing and developing. But then, sometime in their twenties, they start being ashamed of changing and developing any further. It is a very rare thing today that people with gray hair and lined faces still look forward to the arrival of each new year, because it will give their organism new developmental opportunities, will enable them to learn something new that they could not learn before, because their organism was not yet ready for it. Nowadays, people do not let their organism develop. They are ashamed to go on learning, to remain capable of development once they reach the youthful age of thirty or so. It would be important for a person to retain the capacity throughout life to look forward to each new year, because each year conjured forth anew and differently the divine spiritual contents of his inner being. This is something we must really learn, not just to change and develop when young, but to experience ourselves as capable of development throughout our lives between birth and death. Naturally, this will require a new form of education. When old people today think back to their school days, this is not usually a pleasant memory. We must come to shape schooling so that when we recall it later in life, we find in it a continually renewed source of vitality. You can see from this that here too we can find the means to really perceive the divine spirit within us to experience in ourselves something above and beyond the life arising in us merely through external stimulus. Other things too must be acknowledged today. People are as yet unaware of a secret of life intimately connected with our present evolutionary moment. In older times, before the mid-fifteenth century, there was no need to pay much attention to this secret. But today we must do so. It is this. As we are presently constituted in body, soul, and spirit, each night, in a certain way, we perceive the events of the coming day, albeit without these events coming to full waking consciousness. It is our angel who has this prevision. In other words, what we experience during the night in community with the being we call our angel is a preview of the coming day. This is not said to awaken mere human curiosity. That would be quite mistaken. But for practical purposes, to enrich practical life. Only when we are inwardly pervaded by this knowledge and outlook will we make decisions in the right way, will we draw thoughts from the night and bring them properly to bear on the course of our day. Let us assume in very specific terms that a person is meant to do a particular thing at midday. His angel and he have already spoken together in the night of what he is to do then. This has been true for people since the mid-fifteenth century. We do not have to be aware of it, and it is not a subject for mere curiosity. But we ought to be pervaded by a sense that what we discuss with our angel in the preceding night should be made fruitful by us during the following day. Much today of a shattering and shocking nature can point us toward what I have just said. These years of pain we have experienced, the past four or five years, can also very gradually teach humanity that there has been a lack of awareness of our connection with higher beings, a connection present in us each day through our experiences of the previous night. So much would have happened differently in these past four or five years if people had been pervaded by the sense of acting in harmony with the speech they had with their angel the night before. Today we must bring such things to light. People need to realize that this life between birth and death is a continuation, 
of the life of soul and spirit we experienced before birth. We must speak of the importance of people experiencing the revelations of the divine in their being throughout their lives and of bearing through waking life a strong sense that what they do from morning to evening is something that has been discussed during sleep with their angel. We must turn to feelings of this kind, much more tangible feelings in relation to the world of spirit than the more abstract doctrines of religious confessions, and at the same time appeal not to egoistic but unegoistic impulses in human nature. Such feelings will give rise to the kind of relationship we need today with beings belonging to the hierarchy of angels. Then these beings will show interest in humankind again. Our sense of the world of spirit must move in this direction. But there is something more. As you know, modern faiths speak a great deal about God and the divine. But what are they really speaking of when they do? Naturally, they are speaking only of something of which at least a nascent awareness exists in the human soul. What matters is not the name you give something, but what is present in the human soul. People speak of God, of Christ, but in fact they are frequently only speaking of their angel, since this is what they can turn to, having an affinity with it in their souls. Irrespective of the doctrines of different faiths, of whether they speak of God or Christ or anything else, the thought substance out of which they speak always only encompasses the angelic beings belonging to humankind, the angeloi. They do not reach higher than this first order of angelic beings, since people today are disinclined to seek a relationship with the world of spirit founded on more than egoism. A connection with the archangeloi, the hierarchy of archangels, must be sought in a different way by substantially widening human interests so that people's feelings can ascend from an inclination to the angeloi and reach as far as the archangeloi. People must have roughly the following inner experience, saying to themselves, in the past four or five years we have experienced terrible events across the civilized world. Many have wondered what the real cause of these events was, and many have laid the blame at each other's door. There has been much talk of guilt and innocence. And yet, if we look deeper than the most superficial of veneers, we will have no interest in this talk of, quote, causes and origins, close quote, of guilt and innocence, simply because it will be apparent that what has risen to the surface of life over these recent years is like a wave brought to the surface of the ocean by the powers at work in its depths. As year succeeded year, the powers at work in the depths of humanity grew ever more turbulent. One nation after another participated in the great human idiocy of these past years, and all one can say is that elemental forces were swirling toward the surface. The ocean of human life had grown turbulent and restless. But for what reason? We will not gain any clarity about this turbulence without seeing it as a really new development in human history. People will have to acknowledge that the battle that has raged over recent years is only the start of events that will unfold in a quite different domain but which have never before been seen in humanity. This is not the end, but the beginning of the greatest conflicts, spiritual conflicts in civilization, and a superficial reflection on human evolution can show this to be the case. It will take all our efforts and concern to be equal to these conflicts. In the forthcoming period, East and West will increasingly be at risk of inner opposition and conflict since each has developed in a different direction. If we wish to understand these things, 
we will need to try to fathom some of the deep riddles of current phenomena. For decades now, Marxist circles have been saying that art, religion, morals, law, science, and so forth are all a kind of ideology. I spoke of this in more detail in title Towards Social Renewal. In other words, the view of life that has developed amongst the ruling classes of civil society over the past three to four hundred years is one that these bourgeois circles have in a rather cowardly way not fully admitted or acknowledged, whereas socialist groups of the past half-century have faced this head-on. They have said this. The real life of society consists only in what is actually happening in it, the commercial factors and powers of the economy. This alone is real. All that humanity elaborates as art, religion, ethics, as science, law, and morality, is just a kind of steam rising from this underlying reality. It is all mere ideology and has no intrinsic reality, just apparent reality. This relates in turn to the endeavors of socialist parties in the modern era, to their belief that they need only change economic life and then everything else in society will change. Everything else, morals, ethics, law, religion, and so forth, they say, is a kind of hot air, an unreality rising as ideology from the only true reality of economic life. But if we broaden our view of things from such a narrow focus, we will take issue with this view of ideology which the ruling classes, too, could have held for the past three to four hundred years if they had not been too cowardly to do so. They, too, have felt that economic life is the only reality and that science, art, religion, and so forth rise from this reality like steam. This was the underlying view of life and the socialists, as its students, have merely drawn the final conclusions from it. The socialists have simply studied this bourgeois world and taken the same perceptions to an extreme. But what I have now expressed is the view that developed in the West, culminating there in the second half of the 19th century and in the 20th. Other impulses in the Orient have led to a worldview that states by contrast, quote, I look upon what occurs outwardly in the world. I see the impressions my senses mediate. I see what I use as tools to work on the world and to change it, and on what shines down to me from the stars. I look too upon my own bodily form. What is this all? It is maya or illusion. The nature of true reality, by contrast, is what I experience within my soul. Close quote. If we translate this word maya not by looking it up in a dictionary, but by pondering its meaning inwardly, we find that it actually equates with the word ideology in the West. For millennia, people in the East have regarded the outer world that acts upon our senses, including the economy, as maya. In the West, on the other hand, people regard as reality what Orientals think of as maya or illusion and see all that rises within the soul as ideology. Both views of the world have attained a certain level. If you ask the leaders of socialist parties, especially in regions where the first revolution, along the lines of the November Revolution, has not yet occurred, they will still tell you the same thing that people were saying until the Great War broke out. That transformation, revolutionizing of the world, does not require any active will, but that it will come about by itself. The November Revolution did alter the ideas of socialist leaders to some extent, not their feelings, but their ideas and concepts. In this view, that nothing much needed to be done, that things would change by themselves, 
we encounter a fatalistic element that made headway in the West. People said that one need only wait for the means of production to develop to the stage where private capital and everything concentrated in it would alter by itself into other forms. This was like saying that the air in this room is stale and I can no longer breathe. I could open the window, but I do not do so. Instead, I'll wait for the air to improve by itself. Fatalism in the West, fatalism in the East, we know these well. In the Orient, as the world view of Maya evolved, people eventually succumbed to complete fatalism. Every world view has the seeds of fatalism within it. But today, we have reached a point when we must emerge from such fatalism. A transition must be found from mere passive observation to the will. To fire our will, we must find impulses, such as those I have offered, to see our birth as a continuation of pre-birth life to remain young at heart even when our hair grows white and our faces lined, to acknowledge the nightly work of the angels and how this plays into our daily lives. This is what is needed. It is necessary that we absorb such impulses into our will, thus broadening our scope of interest rather than focusing narrowly on what only affects our own private individual lives. We must gain a sense of the divergences between East and West. The inner world we in the West see as ideology and the outer world we see as reality. In the East it is the opposite. There the outer world is maya or illusion and the inner world is reality. Faced with this collision between East and West in the modern world, We need to invoke our will in order to emerge from what has become fatalism in these worldviews. We must seek this path, but we'll only find it if we can subscribe seriously to something that the rest of humanity still finds terribly irritating. On one occasion, in a lecture in a city in southern Germany, I said something that greatly irritated people, but which elicited a curious echo. I had uttered one of the truths that must be spoken today. It is not possible to frame the things one speaks in a way that people like. The truth must be spoken. In the context of my lecture, I said that the ruling classes of today have a decadent physical brain. As well as being disagreeable to hear this, it is also an unpleasant thing to say. And yet it is necessary for people to hear it. Specifically, those who have shaped the times we now live in possess a decadent physical brain. This is simply a fact. Today, in some respects, we are in a similar situation to the people of Europe at the time of the migration period and the spread of Christianity. From the Orient came the Christian impulse, passing first through Greece and Rome. The Greek and Roman world was, of course, more highly developed than the Teutonic. The Teutons were barbarians, yet the brains of the Greeks and the Romans were decadent. And for this reason, the wave of Christianity was not taken up and absorbed by them in the way it was when the Germans encountered it. This was the horizontal migration period. Today it is vertical, a wave of spiritual life descending from the world of spirit. Just as Christianity first surged over the Greeks and Romans, so now the world of spirit is surging over the modern world, over middle-class society, and the latter is decadent. The proletariat, however, is not yet decadent. The working classes can still comprehend what is meant by the world of spirit. But the others will need the preparation that anthroposophy affords. In other words, they will have to develop the part of the brain that is not yet physical, the etheric brain. Today, inevitably, the ruling classes of society will soon not only possess a decadent brain, 
but will become entirely decadent if they fail to understand that they must employ supersensible means to comprehend a spiritual worldview. That is the tragedy of the intellectual middle classes. They wish to comprehend everything in physical terms, whereas today we must grasp things with the etheric brain, that is, absorb spiritual truths. This is the direction modern humanity must advance in, and here the West must take the lead. And in this regard, we have to recognize something very important. If you study philology, the development of language across the globe, and in particular, examine the German language, you will find that it is subject today to terrible misuse. Yet we know, if we look back a little way to the language of Goethe or Lessing, that not so long ago words in German were capable of according with spiritual reality, of giving apt expression to it. Nowadays we have neglected language terribly, devalued it to empty phrases. As yet language itself has not become so devalued that it cannot be spiritual, but the further west we go to western languages, the more we find that these languages themselves are increasingly devoid of the real spiritual element, that they have discarded spirit from their sounds and very tone, even from their grammatical constructions. This discarding of soul and spirit from Anglo-American idiom leads to the global mission of these people. Their world mission consists in learning as they listen to others, They learn this quite instinctively, but they learn it as they seize world dominion, not only to hear tone and speech sound, but also to interpret the gesture of language, to hear more than the merely physical speech sound, something that passes between people as they speak, and yet also goes beyond what is spoken. This is something that passes between their etheric bodies. The secret of Western languages is that the physical tone as such is losing its importance while the spiritual element gains in importance. It is part and parcel of these people's task to let spirit infuse language, not only to hear physically, but to intuit, to feel and sense more than is actually contained in the sounds of speech. In the West, therefore, it will be necessary to seek the spirit through language itself. If we look to the East, by contrast, we discover an increasing urge in Oriental people, as they engage in inner contemplation, not to make do with the ideas of karma and reincarnation developed in earlier times, but to go beyond this and look out into the world, there hearkening to spirit and also founding a kind of vision of nature. These are just small examples of ways to broaden our interests, going beyond our own personal domain and from the perspective of our own national characteristics, gaining a view of the whole of humanity. We can look westward and see ideology at work there, though of a different kind from that in the East. But at the same time, we see how these contrasts give rise to a turbulence of elemental power that is stirred up within humanity. We learn to perceive our place within the whole civilized world, and developing such perception, we can also invoke in ourselves feelings by means of which we can ascend to the sphere of the Angeloi. The scope of our interests is simply broadened to such an extent that we become inclined to concepts that rise to the sphere of the Archangeloi. You see, everything I have told you now about the contrast between ideology and maya and so forth is something whose primal powers unfold in the sphere of the archangeloi, the archangels. Here we pass beyond the sphere of the angeloi. And from this you can see what modern humanity really needs. If someone speaks as I have done now about maya and ideology and so forth, 
and even of the primal powers in the sphere of the archangeloi, in which these powers originate, clever folk will think him a half-wit. This is because the mentality, the intellectual acuity people have achieved has closed them off from the great interests of humanity. We can only broaden the scope of our interests from a spiritual perspective by penetrating the sphere where work unfolds in relation to matters of great concern for humanity. Now, I have given you an idea of how we can work our way upward into the sphere of the Archangeloi. We can work our way up still higher, and this is also something that modern humankind must learn. Our educated classes have been compelled to look back to Greek times, that is, in so far as they were men, though the same thing now holds true for the education of young women. They had to have a grammar school education, during which they absorbed aspects of ancient Greek culture. This enabled them, increasingly, to feel their way back into the world of ancient Greece, motivated them to do so. This is highly significant for our civilization, that in our most formative years we learn what the Greeks achieved. The Greeks themselves did things differently. It did not, of course, occur to them to make their youngsters learn Egyptian, but instead they attended to their own immediate reality. The Greeks had a sense for immediate reality, whereas we occupy our young people with anything other than the reality of their surroundings. We do not give them an inclination for reality, but transpose them back into ancient times. And we have no idea at all what we are doing in the process. You see, we are not just teaching young ladies and gentlemen ancient Greek language, but also something that lies in the very sounds and grammar of that language, the whole character of a nation and people. By absorbing ancient Greek, as is the practice today, a person's soul also assumes a configuration resembling the ancient Greek disposition. Ancient Greek culture allowed only a small stratum of society to participate in culture, while all others were slaves. In Greece only a free man was permitted to engage with science, politics, and at the most, but only under supervision, with agriculture, whereas everything else was performed by slaves. And this fact is embedded in the language itself. By appropriating ancient Greek culture and language, we are uniting our own culture with an aristocratic outlook. It was natural for the Greeks to orient their whole social organism to this culture, for the latter was connected with the blood, with the line of descent. There were the broad masses and then those of a higher stratum, who possessed a higher life of culture, already by virtue of their blood. This comes to expression even in Greek sculpture. Compare the Mercury type with the Zeus or Athena type, a different position of nose and ears. The Greek knew exactly what he was trying to express in his distinction between the Mercury type on the one hand and the Zeus type on the other. All this still influences us far more than we realize. As we form our world views today, we are in fact still formulating ideas born from outlooks in ancient Greece, based on blood descent. Our culture is pervaded by what we absorb from ancient Greece. It intrudes into our era in a luciferic fashion. Greek culture metamorphosed into Roman culture and was succeeded by it. Compared to the Greeks, the Romans were a down-to-earth, prosaic people and developed other aspects of life. What Greek culture, based on bloodline, the Romans embodied in more abstract form as, quote, citizen of the state, close quote. In Roman times, a person was not so much a human being as a citizen, This would have been incomprehensible to the Greeks, that one is not what one is by virtue of being human, 
but by having one's existence registered in a state archive. This can sometimes assume grotesque forms. I once had a friend who was old. He was 64. One day he said to me, quote, I have now saved enough money, close quote. He had always been poor as a church mouse, quote, to marry the love of my youth, close quote. He had got engaged at 18, but at the time did not have enough money to marry. The two swore to wait for each other until they could marry, and this had finally become possible. By now he was 64 and she was 62. So he returned home and wrote to tell her they could marry at last since he had enough money. But they still could not get married because his parish doubted his existence. The rectory, you see, had burned down many years before, and all birth certificates with it, and there was no one left who could confirm who he was. He himself thought that the fact he was standing there ought to be proof enough, yet there was no legal proof. Eventually they did succeed in getting married, but these difficulties brought home to him how much more important a certificate was than an actual person. In other words, one is a citizen. One is what one is in an abstract context. This outlook is essentially Roman. And everything of this kind that exists in ordinary life is essentially Roman too. Our education is largely taken in hand by the state, which has become so abstract, and which will become a great deal more so still as socialism's influence is increasingly felt. Nowadays people are not educated so as to take their place in the world as human beings, but for a civil profession adapted to the needs of such work. The state takes young people in hand, well, not immediately, since to begin with they are still too bothersome. It leaves them to parents for a while, and then it extends its claws, gets hold of them, and trains them to be what it requires. And it knows very well that people will serve its needs, since it gives them so much, doesn't it? It gives them an economic life, everything they are entitled to, and then pensions them off afterward. You can hear what it means to people to be able to say that they not only get paid for their work, but afterward even get a pension. This is something very pervasive and chains people to the abstract state, and then also pervades their whole outlook. Here, too, the Roman outlook informs people. People today will not understand you if you tell them that they must kindle and activate something in their soul to have a share in their own immortality, to be able to carry their soul actively through the gate of death. They have become entirely unaccustomed to comprehending such a thing. Instead, they are told they need only believe in Christ and in whatever the state does. And they see that they are first provided for by the state, and once they have worked enough, are pensioned off by it. The church takes this one step further. After death, it pensions off the human soul, so that a person does not actually have to work upon his soul during his lifetime, nor do anything to carry it through the gate of death afterward. Nowadays, people are registered and catered for. This Roman state is the second thing we have increasingly absorbed into ourselves. You can discover dire things in this realm. I have just come back from Stuttgart, where I was helping set up the Waldorf School and for this purpose I had to examine various curriculum plans. If I think back to the 70s and 80s of the last century, curricula were fairly short. They just contained the content of subjects that should be taught in each class, learning objectives and content. Otherwise, and in every other respect, teachers were free. But now you find very extensive curricula, in which it is officially decreed exactly how you are meant to teach a subject. Thus the effect of a living individual on another living individual, which is the only thing that matters, is now enshrined in laws and ordinances, has become subject to official decree. This means the death of spiritual life. And this death leads straight back from Central Europe to ancient Rome. So, 
The second thing we have absorbed and integrated is this political legal state originating in Roman culture. In addition to this is something that cannot be transplanted from ancient times into modern ones, economic life. You see, we can regurgitate what the Greeks perceived and knew, can allow the legislative life of the Roman state to impinge on us, but we cannot eat what the Greeks and Romans ate. Economic life has to be a modern affair. Gradually we have succeeded in mingling our economic life with Greek culture, with the Roman state, but now we have the task of separating these things from each other once more of coming to see that these three strata of society that have coagulated, in a sense, from diverse eras, must now be sundered. This also means broadening the scope of our interests, as we did before toward both the Orient and the Occident in spatial geographic terms by bringing them into the present. In turn, this means raising ourselves, making ourselves capable of feelings that can raise us to the archai. But how many people today wish to develop an interest in these things, an unprejudiced interest in how the zeitgeist works as it interweaves different eras as I described it? In Stuttgart, I spoke about the denatured form of our grammar school education. I don't know if this was merely accidental, but a few days after my talk, big announcements appeared in the Stuttgart newspapers, signed by all kinds of important figures, professors, and so on, stating that a grammar school education should not be undervalued, and that it made fine contributions to the greatness of the German people, which had come so gloriously to the fore in recent times. It is hard to credit but this was literally what was said by the educators of our youth in April 1919, just a few months after October 1918. In our time such things are possible. Other things are possible too. We cannot get any further until we come to see how we must absorb impulses that flow from the world of spirit into our physical world, understanding that just as we are connected through our corporeal organism with the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, and mineral kingdom. So our spiritual organization is connected with the hierarchies of the angeloi, arch angeloi, and archai, spirits of personality as the guardians of personal development, nation spirits as the guardians of the people's ongoing development within spatial conditions, and time spirits as the guardians of evolution through time. We must grasp these in their spiritual foundations. Everything today depends on this, that we find the courage and strength to look into the world of spirit. We stand at the beginning of a surge of dire conflict, of great turmoil in all human instincts that arise from the half-truth, on the one hand, that economic life is the only reality and that all soul and spirit are ideology, and on the other hand, that soul and spirit are the only reality and everything outward is merely maya. These contrary views will unleash in human nature instincts of a kind that will long, long feed the flames of spiritual battle, in forms of which humanity today as yet has no inkling. We need to know this, and we will need to know also how we can raise ourselves to vision of the world of spirit as the times require us to. The times themselves command and prompt this, and we must attend to it. We will speak further of this tomorrow.